Hello everyone, thank you for popping by. I do hope you're having a great day and looking forward to the weekend. Now, having a look around, I found this story from Holland from earlier this month. It seems to be for a TV series. Look at the headline, Top Doctor, about growing up at Jehovah's Witnesses. I had nothing else to do but read the Bible or my mathematics books. The fact that my parents did not want to support me in my studies probably made me choose the longest study of all, and that was medicine. At the age of 38, robotographer, I'm going to say this wrong, I apologise, Carol Decker is probably one of the youngest professors in medicine, partly due to his parents, who were witnesses of Jehovah, he says. All extracurricular activities were denied him, so he only had to read the Bible at home or his mathematics books. I chose science. And here's another article with some more info on the subject. There is the chap in question. A headline there from Jehovah to Top Doctor. Um, So it follows his first day as a professor. Now he specializes in treating kidney and bladder tumors with robotic surgery. In tonight's episode, he sees a patient with bladder cancer and during a long and complex robot operation, he will make a replacement bladder from a small intestine. Wow. Um, It was far from evident to Decker Stecker, pardon me, to become a surgeon. My parents were Jehovah's Witnesses and they did not want to support my studies. They wanted me to do a simple job so that I could spend as much time as possible on proclaiming that belief. However, I rather read my maths books than the Bible. Oof, well, I'm sure um, some Jehovah's Witnesses will take advantage of or benefit from the knowledge you gained and your practices. Thanks for watching. Bye. Watchtower, what do you think of all this highfalutin book learning? Has the governing body changed its position? Regarding the pursuit of higher secular education? No. We feel that all of the cautions that we have addressed in the past are still valid. However, our goal now is to focus on and intensify our promotion of the pursuit of divine education. If parents and young ones are motivated to avidly pursue divine education, the quest for higher secular education becomes less and less of an issue. The cost of obtaining university training is not our primary concern. It is the potential for spiritual harm that has moved us to provide the cautions we have shared in the past. All too often, our young people have met with spiritual disaster especially after leaving home and living on a university campus. So parents and children, you need to have a goal and you need to have a plan. If you're missing either one, Satan will provide it for you. Young people, ask yourself, why am I considering additional education? Is it because I'm pursuing a specific skill or trade to support my service to Jehovah? Or have I been pressured by the system into believing that higher education will somehow make me a more respected person or lead me to a better life? If we are in continued association with those who do not believe the same, it can erode our thinking and convictions. Some have felt that spending time with non-believers in a university setting is no different than working secularly with those who do not share our beliefs. It is one thing to work on a job with others and quite another matter to immerse oneself in an institution of learning. We are to be careful that this system does not mold or shape our thinking. Higher learning can easily influence thinking and attitudes. Elders in congregations that are in close proximity 
to universities are well aware of the repeated scenario of parents coming to the Kingdom Hall with a child that they're dropping off to attend the nearby university. Sadly, often in a few weeks or months, the child begins missing meetings. And not too long into the school year, he totally disappears. My question is, who dropped them off at the university? So where does the responsibility really lie? When we make a decision, we must realistically also accept the consequences. If we should be that careful about our association inside the congregation, the application is even more appropriate when it comes to institutions of secular learning. I have long said, the better the university, the greater the danger. The most intelligent and eloquent professors will be trying to reshape the thinking of your child. One mom, I recall, asked me to try and help her son who was attending a prestigious name university in Rhode Island. After visiting him, I later had to inform her that her son now believed in evolution. She refused to believe it until he finally told her himself. How sad. Ultimately, the parents must decide how much education a child needs to succeed in life. But does that mean that any decision a parent makes regarding a child's education is fine with Jehovah? Here, Jehovah guarantees that one day, every person on earth will be a true worshiper of him. Will you be there? Will your son or daughter be among those alive at that time? Do your personal decisions matter? Yes. So then, each of us will render an account for himself to God. Yes, we all will have to answer to Jehovah for the decisions we make today. May we all decide to play it safe before our God. Think of all the opportunities there are now to enjoy divine education, congregation meetings, family worship, assemblies and conventions, the JW.org website, and the station you're watching right now. In addition to promoting divine education, what secular skills will we be promoting? Skills that will be useful to God's organization now and after Armageddon. For example, we need construction skills around the world right now. And think about this. We will not need doctors or lawyers after Armageddon, but we will need carpenters and plumbers and similar construction trades. It requires faith to decline higher education and have the confidence that our material needs will be cared for by training in other fields of employment. Speaking of lawyers, we have an interesting perspective from Brother Philip Brumley of the legal department. So the organization made a decision to send you through law school. Um, what effect did that have on you? Something happened that I was not uh, prepared for. Um, when you hear that repeated over a four-year period, it can start creeping into your mind. Another thing that happened uh, related to that was there is a fierce spirit of competition in law school. Uh, how did you come to discern that, that this uh, kind of thinking was, was rubbing off on you? Uh, in all candor, David, I didn't discern. It wasn't until after I had gotten out of law school that my wife Elizabeth sat me down one day and in so many words told me, you're not the man I married. She pointed out the uh, character flaws that had developed in me, um, ambition, um, egotism, uh, selfishness, uh, combativeness, being argumentative. In all candor, David, it was a lengthy process to get these elements out of my system. So this was a number of years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, you're all better, mm -hmm. received no uh, residual effects then from the, the training? We have to keep working on these things. And when something favorable happens, 
rather than in any way thinking, well, that was because I did such a good job. The genuine reality of it is that Jehovah did a good job. This was what Jehovah wanted to have happen, and that's why we were successful. Why, are, why is an individual obtaining this additional training? The second thing for someone to keep in mind is to be focused on what they really are going to learn. To attend a university learning things that have little to do with what one can do to earn a living really has, serves no purpose. On the other hand, if a person happens to have a, an inclination towards uh, medicine, well, uh, becoming a nurse rather than becoming a doctor could be an appropriate step. If a person has an inclination towards the law, becoming a paralegal rather than an attorney could be an appropriate step. So rather than uh, uh, devoting or allowing this world to consume four, six, eight, or ten years of studies, why not focus on two years of study to get some technical training that would facilitate or help someone to become a good regular pioneer? Thank you, brothers, for sharing that very interesting perspective about the subtle mental conditioning that can transpire when exposed to higher education. Given the spiritual dangers involved, though, the governing body has decided that if we need additional attorneys in the future, we will not expose a member of the Bethel family to the environment of higher education. One brother likened his experience in a university setting to being in a house that is on fire. Even if you escape alive, your clothes still smell like smoke. Higher education often instills a sense of superiority and self-reliance that is in direct opposition to the Christian personality. A circuit overseer sent me a letter in which he described what he called a picture-perfect witness family until the oldest son received a full scholarship to attend a university. The short story is the son left the truth. The parents divorced. His siblings are not doing anything for Jehovah. So sad. The years after high school are your best years because you are young and strong and healthy and you don't have a lot of obligations to complicate your life. Why not give your first fruits to Jehovah and pioneer for a year and then consider how much additional education is required? Remember, divine education truly is the opportunity of an everlasting lifetime.